Welcome and thank you for being here for this important presentation and public hearing uh, of the Task Force to Reimagine Policing in Brookline. I'm Raul Fernandez, select board member and chair of the task force. I hope that by now um, you've all read or at least perused our preliminary draft report. A uh, link to that report has been um, or will be posted in the chat uh, and is available online by searching select boards task force to reimagine policing in Brookline. You'll see a link to the document um, just below the information for this public hearing on that web page. Uh, I should note that our subcommittees have already held five public hearings, the recordings of which are also available on our website. That's in addition to a joint public hearing that we held with the police reform committee toward the end of last year. Uh, tonight is a public hearing on the draft report of the full task force, an important step before presenting our final report to the select board on March 2nd. Our agenda tonight is twofold. First, to present our charge, process, findings, and recommendations. With more than six months of work and a lot of ground to cover, we'll do our best to keep this part till under an hour. Uh, after we're done presenting, we wanna hear from you. You have an opportunity to share your views with us live, or you can email your thoughts to Brookline's Administrative Services Director, Devin Fields at dfields at brooklinema.gov. Written comments will be shared with the task force and preserved as part of the public record. For those who are interested in providing public comment tonight, please use the Q&A feature at any point during the night to indicate that you would like to make a comment. We'll add you to the queue to speak when the public hearing opens at the conclusion of the presentation. We ask that you keep your comments to three minutes so that we can hear from as many people as possible tonight. The public hearing is scheduled to go into 9 p.m., but we'll go later depending on how many people are interested in speaking. You're welcome to ask questions and we'll do our best to respond, but our primary goal here is to listen and consider your views as we develop our final report. So let's get started. Just gonna have a slideshow uh, come up right now. Perfect. Thank you so much, Devin. Well, it's important you know, to first recognize why we're here in the first place. Um, there is, of course, a, a horrifying genesis and disturbing history of policing in America, um, from the early slave patrols to the killings, including lynchings of Black, Indigenous, Mexican, and Chinese people, to the control exerted through brutality over immigrants and poor people of all racial backgrounds. Uh, history here has been well chronicled uh, and yet not fully embraced um, by police who so often trace their origins back to Sir Robert Peel, yet seldom speak of the legacy of these atrocities, which are much closer to home. Uh, this legacy is critical to understanding the need for reimagining, and I encourage you to start by reading or listening to, there is an audio version, of this New Yorker piece, The Invention of Police. Of course, more proximately, the reason we're here tonight is because of the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, uh, and other Black, Latinx, and Indigenous people, and the subsequent righteous, multicultural, multiracial, multigenerational uprising demanding greater oversight and accountability of police but also one which knows its history and understands how even the best intention reforms, decade after decade, have failed to make policing safe, just, and equitable, especially for communities of color. Police reform has failed communities of color time and again, and without a meaningful reimagining of public safety, it will again. And no, this isn't about what happened so many years ago or a thousand miles away in Minneapolis or Louisville or Ferguson. This work is about policing right here in Brookline. It's about the many complaints, those that have been filed and the many more that have been shared in other ways, including by two of Brookline's own now former police officers. We understand that there are many people in this community who love the police department and have only had good experiences. But as one insightful commenter said at a previous public hearing, your good experience does not cancel out someone else's bad experience. There's a certain human tendency to believe that something isn't a problem for anyone because it hasn't been a problem for us. The 11 members of our task force do believe inequitable policing is a problem in Brookline and we're not alone. We're joined by Brookline's Anyosa family whose daily peaceful protests along Route 9 brought hundreds of residents to join them and then hundreds more at protests across from the Brookline Police Department. We're joined by Brookline's Lexi Harriman, BHS students and thousands of residents and neighbors who took to the streets peacefully to share their stories of local issues with policing right here in Brookline demanding justice and accountability. For anyone who attended these events and others like the Humanized Black Voices event led by young people on Cypress Field, the evidence is clear. Yes, there is a problem here in Brookline. 
Last June, Brookline Select Board, in the midst of public outcry, made a symbolic gesture to shift 166,000 in police overtime to other purposes related to social services. Soon after, a town meeting rejected more substantive cuts to the police budget, with many citing the need to know more about how these funds could better be spent. I had, prior to the select board and town meeting votes, proposed a reimagining of policing and public safety more broadly, one that would explore, propose, and recommend investing in alternatives to policing where appropriate. There were several, several key tenets embedded in that proposal. First, that a community holds the power to determine its own approach to community safety, which includes determining if and how police should be part of that approach. Second, that there are members of our community and those in our neighboring communities for which Brookline's current model is simply not working, and that's unacceptable. Third, that police need to be held to the highest standards and we need clear accountability measures for what happens when officers fail to live up to those standards. And finally, that this moment is an opportunity to rethink our relationship with police, yes, but also to reconsider how we invest in the long-term well-being of residents and neighbors. I first shared that proposal publicly on June 3rd, and after a contentious town meeting season and weeks of debate on the select board, the proposal for a task force to reimagine policing in Brookline, after first being rejected in its current form, later passed unanimously on July 21st. The select board decided to create two bodies that night. One committee focused on reform, chaired by Bernard Green, and a separate task force focused on reimagining, chaired by me. And this is our task force charge as approved by the select board. To explore and recommend new approaches to public safety and policing in Brookline, using a data-informed approach to interrogate our current model and ultimately providing a distinctly alternative approach to public safety. To seek to understand our approach to public safety, to seek to understand how certain populations, including but not limited to Black, Indigenous, people of color, women, and LGBTQ plus people experience policing in Brookline, to explore alternative models of public safety in the US and abroad, to conceptualize new models of public safety that have yet to be imagined, to consider which police functions are better suited for other departments, to solicit public feedback and ideas through robust community engagement, to make recommendations for meaningful changes that can be enacted by the select board, town meeting, school committee, or other relevant bodies, to make legislative recommendations to our state and congressional representatives, and other tasks as determined by the task force members and community input. And here are those task force members. I serve as chair, I'm a Brookline Select Board member and associate dean for equity, diversity, and inclusion at BU's Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. Bonnie Bastian is a town meeting member, an artist, a volunteer with the Massachusetts Bail Fund, and a member of Brookline for Racial Justice and Equity and Brookline Budget Justice. Malcolm Cawthorn is the MECO coordinator at Brookline High School and a member of the Commission for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations. Almas Dosa is the director of home and community-based services at the Mass Health Office of Long-Term Services and Supports and a member of the Racial Justice Action Committee at First Parish in Brookline. Eitan Hirsch is an associate professor of political science and civic studies at Tufts University, a data scientist and board member of Brookline for Everyone. Kimberly Richardson is a judicial secretary at the Roxbury Trial Court, a graduate student at BU School of Social Work and a board member of Brookline for Racial Justice and Equity. Mike Salmon is the chair of Brookline's advisory committee and a board member of SCORE Mentors. Kristen Singleton is the Director of Knowledge and Technological Services at Education Resource Strategies, a national education nonprofit. Ann Weaver is a town meeting member and licensed mental health counselor and an adjunct professor of counseling, victimology and trauma and crisis intervention. Alexander Weinstein is a third year law student at Boston University, a member of the National Transgender Bar Association and a legal intern in the Mass Attorney General's office. And Chi Chi Wu is a staff attorney at National Consumer Law Center and a member of the Brookline Asian American Family Network Steering Committee. I'm proud that this group exceeded the criteria for diversity as outlined in the charge, which was that at least half would be people from communities disproportionately impacted by policing, including Black, Indigenous, people of color, women, and LGBTQ plus people. There are six members of color, including one Latinx, two Asian, and three Black members, as well as five women and one transgender member. Immigrants and one Brookline Housing Authority resident are also included among the members. As a group, we represent a wide variety of ages, identities, and experiences. 
I also want to thank the staff who've attended nearly all of our weekly meetings for more than six months and have been engaged and responsive throughout. They are Town Administrator Mel Kleckner, Human Resources Director Ann Braga, Associate Town Council Michael Downey, Chief Diversity Officer Lloyd Gellano, former Brookline Chief of Police Daniel O'Leary, and Administrative Services Director Devin Williams, who's been an invaluable resource for the task force and the select board. With respect to process, as I mentioned, we've been holding these weekly full task force meetings and weekly meetings of our subcommittees, which include community engagement and departmental analysis, as well as subcommittees focused on the school resource officers, the walk and talk unit, vulnerable people and people in crisis. Um, you'll hear from representatives of those subcommittees a lot more about their process in just a bit. Uh, first, I wanna introduce one of our task force members and data scientist, Aton Hirsch, who led a partnership between our task force and Tufts University to survey residents about their views on policing in Brookline. Uh, please pay close attention because what you're about to see aligns well with the findings and recommendations of our subcommittees. Uh, Eitan, take it away. Thank you, Raul. It's a pleasure to be with you all today and uh, an honor to be on this task force. Uh, just to reiterate, this was a survey that was done um, uh, led by my colleague at Tufts University, Brian Shafter, who was surveying uh, two other communities in Massachusetts, Medford and Somerville. And it just happened to be the timing worked uh, perfectly for our task force. So we um, asked Professor Schaffner to implement this study here, uh, funded in part, funded in terms of uh, postage and mailers uh, by Brookline. And, and then I've done some data analysis and written a report which is public, including the raw data files also public. So, um, this, uh, if you, you might have gotten it in the mail, it came uh, right around Thanksgiving. And we targeted uh, a general population of the town, but also a significant oversample of individuals who were likely to be um, African-American, Latino. Uh, overall, we had a 5.4% response rate. Um, just to show you a few uh, graphics here, um, most of what I'm going to show you today very briefly is organized by uh, racial identity. We had close to 100 African-American Latino respondents um, combined. Uh, and, and so what we see at first is that there's generally uh, pretty high levels of overall satisfaction. More than 60% of white, black, and Asian identifiers report satisfaction. The lowest level of satisfaction overall with the police department comes from uh, Latinx identifiers. Um, most people have positive experiences, but a handful of people, a, large, a significant number of actually respondents have had negative experiences with the police department here in Brookline. Um, and as you can see, uh, it's African Americans and Latinx respondents who were significantly more likely to say that they've had a negative experience with the Brookline police, so about you know, 10 percentage points higher. Uh, we asked if uh, Brookline, the Brookline police makes you, the respondent, feel mostly safe or unsafe. And what we discovered in this question, the way people answered it, is 10% um, uh, of, of whites, 7% of Asians, 4% of African Americans, and 16% of Latinx respondents reported feeling unsafe. Um, however, when we looked at a question specifically about police brutality, we see a different pattern emerging. And that pattern is that um, white residents of Brookline who took our survey uh, report almost never feeling like they're gonna be a victim of police brutality. It's quite low for Asian Americans too, but between a quarter and a third of Af African Americans and Latin Latino respondents said they are somewhat or very often worrying about being the victim of police brutality. If you needed help, how comfortable would you feel calling the police? Again, we see about two thirds of white and Asian respondents said they'd be very comfortable, but only half of African American Latino respondents in Brookline would feel comfortable. We asked how effective the police are at various jobs. And in terms of ensuring public safety and fighting crime and making residents feel safe, uh, respondents across racial groups responded that the police were very effective. But at certain rules, particularly holding police officers accountable, the majority of respondents in Brookline do not feel like the Brookline police holds police officers accountable. Um, we asked respondents if they ever felt discriminated against by the Brookline police because of their race or ethnicity. And I just want to reiterate here that this is not a general perceptions of police in general. Every one of these questions asked specifically about the Brookline police. And what we see is that uh, white residents basically never, only 0.5% uh, 
felt discriminated against by the police uh, because of their race or ethnicity, but um, it was significantly higher for African Americans and for Latino respondents. Have you ever felt discriminated against based on your gender? Again, pretty low levels uh, overall, but African Americans here are about a little more than twice as likely as white respondents to say they feel discriminated against on the basis of gender. How about on the basis of economic status? Very low for white, Latino, and Asian respondents, um, much higher for African American respondents. Um, we asked all respondents of all races, do you think that uh, the Brookline police treats these different racial groups uh, fairly or unfairly? And basically uh, no one in any racial group thinks that the Brookline Police Department treats white residents unfairly. A greater percent, 10 to 20% of all racial groups thinks that Asian Americans are treated unfairly by the Brookline Police Department. And then as much higher for, Af for Latinos and African Americans. For Latinos, it's you know, 30 to 50% and for uh, African Americans as well, next, yep, 30 to 50% as well. Uh, so we see these kind of widespread perceptions of discrimination against African Americans and Latinos in particular. We asked um, if, uh, if, here's the prompt, in given situations it's possible to have police or social service workers respond. For each of the following situations, please indicate whether you would be better for the police or social service workers to respond. We see very interesting results in this, in this uh, table, which is that for certain roles, like in, if there's a situation of an armed individual robbery, respondents overwhelmingly close to 100% think that's something that the police should do. But actually in most situations, including dealing with, dealing with uh, residents who are dealing with overdose, intoxication, uh, mental health crisis, homelessness, neighborhood dispute, the majority of respondents is actually only social service workers, not police and not both should be doing, engaging in this uh, response. Um, there was a few questions about potential civilian oversight, which is something that our task force has spent some time thinking about. So the question reads, um, some communities have civilian review boards. Uh, the boards review actions of police and hear complaints. Do you think Brookline should have a civilian review board? And overwhelmingly, the response is yes. Um, if we have a, Brookline, uh, a civilian review board, which of the following powers do you think that board should have? And we have is overwhelming support for most uh, for, for some of these powers, such as investigating excessive force and abuse allegations, investigating shootings, evaluating police dis disciplinary process, setting policing priorities. And obviously there are some like hiring and firing of officers and negotiating police contracts where respondents to the survey didn't think that was the role for a civilian review board. Just to run through some brief conclusions uh, to set the stage here, um, and, and I'd really encourage you to read the full report and, and analyze the data yourself if you'd like to, it's all in the public record. Um, overall, perceptions of the Brooklyn police are positive, but they're least positive among Black and Latinx residents uh, who report, they're 15 times more likely to report they're worried about police brutality. Um, Black and Latino residents mostly feel safe, but are less comfortable calling the Brookline police when needed, when in need compared to uh, white or Asian residents. And residents do not believe the Brookline police is effective at holding officers accountable for their actions. Um, black residents much more likely than others to feel discriminated against by the Brookline police on the basis of race, gender, and economic status. 30 to 50% of Brookline residents of all racial groups perceive that the Brookline police treats black and Latinx residents unfairly. Brookline residents have a strong preference for social service workers responding rather than police in scenarios including mental health crisis, overdose, homelessness, and neighborly disputes. Residents overwhelmingly believe that Brookline should have an oversight board and they support the board having the power to investigate police misconduct and excessive force, evaluating disciplinary procedures and setting policing priorities. And with that, I will turn it back to you. Well, thanks so much, Eitan. Uh, just wanna say how fortunate we are to have you and your expertise as part of this work. Um, you know, certainly what's clear to me from these results is Brookline residents overwhelmingly favor increasing transparency, oversight, and accountability while also limiting some of the scope and powers of police. And, and I think we'll talk more about that. Um, in addition to analyzing this big data, we also engaged uh, in an approach that we called going small, which was led by our community engagement subcommittee, that real personal contact with folks to, um, to learn more about people's experiences. Um, here to talk more about that important work is task force member, Malcolm Cawthorn. Malcolm, take it away. Thank you, Raul, thank you. Um, for those who came, as well as 
you know, the outstanding work by um, high committee members who are listed here, Bonnie Bastian, myself, Eitan Hers, Chi Chi Wu, and Kristen Singleton was our subcommittee chair. Um, <clears throat> for background, the Envisioning and Community Engagement Subcommittee was formed to assess and engage the Brookline community on its perspectives, attitudes, needs, once and once regarding public safety, the charge of the subcommittee is to ensure that the attitudes and perspectives of both white residents and residents from communities of colors are, are thoughtfully included in the recommendations, applying a racial equity lens to <clears throat> analyze, to, uh, uh, sorry, applying a racial equity lens um, in analysis of current practices and recommendations for improvement. So part of our process was, Raul already mentioned, the idea of going small. One of the things we learned through this work is that it was really hard to bring a lot of people to us um, for a host of reasons that we won't go into right now. And so the turn was to go small, to talk to organizations, to talk one-on-one, -on -one, um, and to build trust in different communities that frankly don't have a lot of trust in government agencies. And so this was, met uh, really well, Brooke, we met with Brookline Racial Justice and Equity or Bridge, Brookline Budget Justice, as well as individual residents from public housing. Uh, we also had discussions with um, <clears throat> community, people in the community police division, um, Lieutenant Jim Pass here, Officer David Pilgrim and former Chief Dan O'Leary. Uh, we also had interviews and discussions with youth service providers, Alicia Adamson, who's the director of the Brookline Teen Center and Lee Jackson, who's the director of Brookline Recreation. So three major findings. There's more, again, the report is public. You should read it. There's uh, more context. Um, but one of the things was that the survey that Aton just spoke about shows that there's a general satisfaction with the Brookline Police Department and a majority of respondents report real issues with transparency and racial discrimination. Each subcommittee, which you'll hear from, you know, like what I'm doing now, hear from the others, points to distinct things that either the police department needs to add, remove, or make radical changes through its findings. The Brookline Police community engagement is done and evaluated without a community voice or lens to substantiate its successes. And that's really important. So we came up with five recommendations. The first is implementing a child-centric uh, vision of public safety. The idea that we would put children first and think about what it means for children to be publicly safe in a multitude of facets. Um, and that's from you know birth to 18 at minimum, if not until 21. Uh, to have a public safety website, um, it continues to need work. Uh, if you look at the um, organizational structure for the town, they list uh, police, fire, and buildings under public safety. And then if you look at the town website, it only lists police and fire. Um, and, and then not much other than that. Um, we need to have community engagement that's not community policing. And so um, what we want to differentiate is the idea that there's actually engagement, um, which connects to four in a two-way manner. What we found a lot of is that, you know, what the police were saying was community engagement, actually Brookline residents didn't even know about. And so it's hard to quantify that. And so we want to eliminate that one-way relationship. And then as we talked about going small, we feel like the town has to do a better job of reaching to citizens in small manners where they can build trust and where we can establish trust in government agencies as opposed to expecting all citizens to just come to us and speak. Thank you. Great, thanks Malcolm. And as, as, as Malcolm said, please, there's, there's a lot of rich information in the full reports. If you haven't done that already, please um, read the full report. Um, in addition, I would say uh, to your collective work on community engagement, um, this subcommittee in particular kept us grounded and constantly reminded of why we're here because our existing model has not worked for everyone that we can, should, and must do better. Uh, next up is our departmental analysis subcommittee. Here to talk about their work is task force member Chi Chi Wu. Chi Chi, floor is yours. Great, thanks Raul, and thanks for your leadership on this task force. Uh, so the departmental analysis subcommittee consisted of Dr. Eitan Hirsch, who you just heard from on uh, the survey results, um, Dr. Raul Fernandez, our task force chair, um, Mike Sandman, who's the chair of the advisory committee, and myself. Um, so our charge and our mission was to engage in a high level review of the structure and the functions of the police department. This was basically the 30,000 foot uh, review or look. We ended up focusing on two areas. One, 
a process question. Um, looking at the police department, how do we make sure there's an ongoing structure for community stakeholder input, for reevaluation, innovation, and most importantly, oversight? And then in terms of the substantive issue we focused on, so there's, there's some subcommittees that look at specific functions of the police department, the walk and talk unit, um, the school resource officer, uh, vulnerable populations. So we looked at a bunch of the other functions of the police department and we decided we would focus on restructuring or reimagining traffic enforcement. Because if you think about it, traffic enforcement is often the most um, frequent interaction between police and civilians. Uh, something like 50% of police civilian interactions are in the context of traffic enforcement. So we ended up uh, focusing on that particular issue. Process. Um, our process, uh, we ex ended up uh, involved in a lot of data analysis, um, lots and lots of data. So we started off with comparing Brookline to other municipalities, looking at um, some of our peer communities like Newton uh, or some communities in Massachusetts or similar in size like, like Malden. We also looked at communities in other parts of the country that are kind of like ours, niche communities, um, you know, wealthier suburbs outside of a ma major city um, like um, Evanston, Illinois, um, and a couple of municipalities like Eugene, Oregon, where we're seeing a lot of in innovation. And we looked at things like size of their police budget, um, per capita expenditure, per capita police officers to uh, citizenry, um, FBI crime statistics. And you can see those spreadsheets. The Appendix B of our report um, has the overview and then links, links to in Appendix B actually shows you the spreadsheets. And we came away with this data analysis with very few conclusions, actually. Um, it turns out that the biggest correlation we could see is that per capita spending seems to tinge on or is correlated with median income in communities and, and not so much other stuff. Okay, so then um, we conducted a lot of interviews, which are summarized in Appendix A with um, former Chief O'Leary and Interim Chief Morgan on some of the process questions, and then city councilors in Cambridge and Berkeley on some of the traffic enforcement, um, some of the traffic enforcement ideas, as well as Rasan Hall, who's the director of the racial justice program at the ACLU of Massachusetts. And then we had some data presentations by former Chief O'Leary, um, and those uh, key elements of those are in Appendix D of our report, as well as a really great presentation by um, Transportation Minister, Administrator Todd Corain on traffic patterns. And you'll see in a little bit why we had a presentation on traffic patterns. Um, next slide, please. So our key findings. Um, on the process issue, you know, the result of, it, you know, examining um, the, you know, the interviews and how the police department gets um, input and oversight, we came to the, um, we um, also, we had the survey as it, uh, Dr. Hirsch mentioned earlier, where 77% of survey um, respondents favored having a civilian oversight board. Um, the interviews, um, revealed that you know that the police department has a fair amount of external input um, some internal input but a limited amount of citizen input and oversight and um, that is something that we really think needs to be addressed on traffic enforcement um, the data revealed that black motorists are disproportionately more likely to be stopped by the brookline police and it wasn't just disproportionately with respect to the, the, the makeup of the population of Brookline itself, because one of the things we heard, one of the, the, the pushback was, um, you know, you can't just look at the population of Brookline because a lot of motorists who go through Brookline um, are, live in other communities, come from other communities, they're commuting to Boston, they're going home from Boston. Um, and that's why we had uh, Transportation Administrator Todd Corain give us a presentation on traffic patterns. And so we figured out where motorists are coming from, um, from the north, from the west, from the south, and from Boston. And we looked at those communities and even those communities, the percentage of black motorists being stopped was disproportionate. And all that data is in our 
our uh, section of the report. Uh, the other statistic that was interesting was that motorists of color, particularly Asian Americans, when they are stopped, are more likely to receive tickets than warnings. Um, and so, um, you know, we started thinking about, is there a better way to do traffic enforcement? And one of the other things we found in our research is that, uh, unfortunately, a significant barrier to reimagining or restructuring traffic enforcement is that Massachusetts state law requires traffic citations to be issued by police officers. So next slide. So our recommendation. Um, our key, key recommendation in terms of process is the creation of a formal civilian oversight board. Um, if you think about it, um, an entity like the police department, you know, just as we have the military in this co country is overseen um, and under the command of civilians, the police department really should have oversight by the civilians, by a civilian entity in the town. Now, right now that's supposed to be the select board. But as you can imagine, the select board has a lot on its plate in terms of governing the entire town and, and all sorts of issues that um, the town deals with and has limited bandwidth. And the, the, the select board often delegates its, some of its functions to another board or committee. Um, example right now is the transportation board. And so our proposal or our recommendation is to create a civilian oversight board um, for the police department, which would be in charge of dealing with civilian uh, citizen complaints, um, but also go a bit be beyond that. Um, we also think some of the more controversial functions or controversial, controversial issues um, should be addressed by a civilian oversight board, such as um, the entering into uh, mutual aid agreements, as well as uh, equipment procurement, given that um, equipment procurement has often involved procurement of military style equipment um, that we think should be over that kind of um, procurement we should think should be overseen by civilians. So that's our first big recommendation. And then in terms of traffic enforcement, um, we do think that the town may, may be better served with traffic functions, certain traffic limit, limited traffic functions fulfilled by civilians. Um, by uh, folks who, you know, uh, if there is conflict, they, they um, don't have, uh, for example, firearms so that we don't see tragic circumstances like Philando Castile. Um, so in order to do that, though, um, there would be a need, need to be a change in Massachusetts law. So we are recommending an introduction of a bill or home rule petition in the state legislature permitting these certain limited traffic functions to be fulfilled by civilians. Um, thank you. Chi-Chi, thanks so much. Uh, it's been great serving with you on this subcommittee. In particular, um, that report that Chi-Chi mentions um, was largely organized and, and, and drafted based on the work of the full subcommittee, of course. Um, but thank you so much for your work on that. Um, you know, in addition to this 30,000 foot view of the department, we actually also dug in and, and focused in on certain programs, uh, including the school resource officer, walk and talk unit, and mental health programs. Uh, our approach to analyzing these programs included reflecting on a few key questions. Um, certainly one question we should also, we should always ask in municipal government and everywhere is, is this program necessary? Uh, does it fit within the scope of police duties? Do the benefits outweigh the costs, especially for communities of color? And could these resources be spent better elsewhere? Uh, and so I encourage you to keep all of these questions in your mind during the next three presentations. Uh, first up is task force member Alexander Weinstein of the School Resource, Resource Officer Subcommittee. <laughs> Alex, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, I served on this committee with Malcolm Cawthorn, Kristen Singleton, and Kimberly Richardson. And so we, uh, a lot of the work that we did went into undercovering the history of the SRO program. Uh, and as you'll hear, this program was established very nearly under cover of night. We did a lot of work, uh, particularly at Malcolm Cawthorn, to uncover the facts uh, and the history behind this position. So we really strongly encourage you to go read the report um, and to see what we found. We conducted interviews with uh, several people, including SRO Caitlin Keneally at the high school uh, and several teachers and staff in PSB schools including a couple, uh, a meeting with the town legal counsel. So for key findings, what we found was that the SRO program was instituted truly without public, uh, sorry, there's a 
fire alarm going near me. Hang on one second. Don't worry about it. I think it just burns them. I'm going to turn that off. Interruption, everybody. I'm happy to keep going or we can skip to somebody else for a few minutes. This might be too early. All right, let's uh, let's just hang for a minute. I'm I'm assuming you'll be able to get that uh, alarm under control. Um, I think it's uh, someone in a different department. I don't think it's. Uh, oh, got it, got it. Um, is there someone else in the subcommittee can take over? Yeah, I'll try to jump in a little bit um, until Alexander uh, can get things worked out where he is. Um, as we were doing our work, uh, one one of the things I think he was about to allude to in our second point was that. Uh, we were doing this work while the police bill um, was being um, worked through the state house. And so it kind of set the, the stage for both our discussions and thinking about how this work um, would unfold both in Brookline and then also at the state level. Uh, Alexander's back. So uh, I'll let you continue, Alexander. Hey, everyone. Sorry for the scare. Everybody's okay here happens when you burn toast in a building with no vents over the stovetops. Um, so thanks so much for picking that up, Kristen. So uh, what we did find was that uh, there was no legal need to have SROs under this new law, as I, I think you finished saying, Kristen. That was just coming off of that. Okay, thank you. And so one the, uh, what we also found is that it seems to be the primary benefit of this program is to police and not to families. There's no evidence that SROs make students feel safer. And what we did find through the, the survey uh, that Aton was talking about earlier is that out of parents with children in schools, only 14% report that law enforcement officers are stationed in the school. 47% say officers are not stationed at the school and 39% are not sure. So it, it's really troubling to the question of if this is meant to be building relationships with students and families, how well that's happening if the parents aren't even aware that this is occurring. And for uh, what we found also through some anecdotal evidence of just conversations that of the parents who are aware that there are police officers in the middle school, that they're not aware that this is considered to be part of the SRO program. There's also no public evaluation process for the SROs or shared data of effectiveness uh, with the schools. It's unclear um, on what standard they're assessed. Uh, it seems to be through the, through the police and it's not clear that the school shares in that process. So our recommendation is to remove the SROs from schools. This does not in, uh, preclude having other relationships with the police, like the possibility of a school liaison. Um, and if we're determined to keep the school resource officers we have to discover that determination through a rigorous public process. We need to land the plane so we can see whether we even need it to take off. And if we find uh, this insistence on keeping the SRO, that insistence can't come solely from the select board, not after the profound lack of transparency surrounding the implementation of this position. The point here isn't so much transparency, which should be a given after that history, as having a true public discussion about whether we need an SRO and why and what form they should take. Also, uh, there's an issue of time sensitivity here we want to make sure to address. There are conversations that are happening this month with students uh, at the high school on their feelings about the SRO position, and we'll need to move quickly in order to be responsive to their concerns. Uh, Alexander, thank you so much uh, for, for doing that and, and powering through the, the alarm and for Kristen for, uh, for pinch hitting there for a bit. Uh, you know, these are, um, you know, important contributions and there is a really deep history that your subcommittee uncovered here. Um, you've got to read the report on this one too, folks, um, to really get the full flavor of that history uh, and, um, and why the, the subcommittee reached the recommendations that they did. Uh, next up uh, is a task force member, Bonnie Bastian of the Walk and Talk subcommittee. Uh, Bonnie, floor is yours. Thank you, Raul. Um, my name is Bonnie and the members of our subcommittee for the Walk and Talk program, um, uh, Kimberly Richardson and Ann Weaver, and I am the subcommittee chair. Um, the Walk and Talk program was started in 1992 
by uh, then Lieutenant Daniel O'Neill, Detective Mark Morgan, Chief Samard, Brian Clunin, who is the ED of the BHA at the time, and Matthew Baronis, who is still Assistant Director and Director of Management. Um, it was at the beginning of a shift toward a new community policing strategy in Brookline. The subcommittee struggled to piece together the whole picture of the program's origins, objectives, and measurable benefits because there are no contracts, no MOUs, no assessments, or written shared objectives between the BHA and the Brookline Police Department anywhere. The gist is that in the late 1980s, there were many BHA residents cycling in and out of the criminal justice system. The walk and talk program was meant to be a way to diffuse and divert the situation. It was also a way to build better relationships with the BHA residents so that their interactions with police are not always bad and to make residents feel comfortable alerting officers to potential problems. The Brookline Police Department states on their website that this is achieved by having a highly visible presence on Brookline Housing Authority properties, doing children's programming, cooking holiday dinners for residents, making themselves available to residents at all hours in case of emergency, and other things that are social service in nature. We know that there are residents that appreciate the program and use its services, but according to the Police Reform Committee survey, which is separate from the one we discussed earlier, only 51% of the 70 residents that responded know that the program exists, and those residents are largely white and over the age of 50. Um, key findings. Uh, but in the interviews and conversations with Black BHA residents, former residents, and organizations that work closely with BHA residents, we have learned that the program is also seen as a detriment. When police are placed in one particular neighborhood out of many with the objective of being highly visible in order to invite information from residents about possible problems in the community, it's understandable that anxiety can develop. Some residents have reported feeling that their children are being surveilled and that they are being policed in their own homes. Despite our many strategies, the subcommittee struggled to find residents willing to speak with us or attend our public meetings. They expressed fear of losing their tenancy for speaking to us about the police. So our solution was, as Malcolm uh, mentioned before, was to go small, to reach out to individual residents, to have anonymous one-on-one -on -one conversations and to inscribe the information without any identifying details. This extreme hesitancy to speak freely about their perspectives on the police is itself evidence of the problematic nature of the walk and talk program. Due to the long history of violence and oppression of black, brown and poor people by police, it's been long reported that police officers can trigger anxiety in those populations and an impulse to avoid interaction with officers or act in a way that won't draw attention. This is not necessarily due to particular officers' actions, but rather to a person's understanding of an experience with the institution of policing in the United States. Um, when considering how to weigh this information we have received from residents about their experiences with the program, we can't use a majority wins measurement. The individuals that are expressing discomfort in their home with the program and fear of speaking out about it may be in the minority, but their experiences are not less important than those that feel comfortable expressing their satisfaction with the program. While we estimate that their numbers are smaller than those in favor of the program, almost every person we spoke with that disliked the program was Black. We need to pay particular attention when the people who feel uncomfortable or unsafe are black and brown residents whose population make up a small minority in Brookline. When those voices are drowned out, we uphold racist systems. The walk and talk program is a part of a public safety strategy. Therefore, if some of the community feels unsafe because of the program itself, then the strategy is not providing public safety. So in closing, our findings are not based, are based, I'm sorry, are not are based not on whether or not an individual officer is liked or disliked, but rather we are examining the system and the environment the walk and talk program creates. The central question to our work is are police officers the best or even the most logical professionals suited to providing social services 
and building personal relationships in a multiracial housing authority? And our answer is no. Police officers doing this work is a conflict of interest. So we offer the following recommendations. In the short term, develop an effective, comprehensive, and easily accessible website that provides access to currently available social services and other resources, and centralizes the advocacy and visioning work toward a new community-driven public safety system. And two, center the people most affected by public safety challenges in this process to develop an improved system of public safety Continue the community engagement work that we have begun, which is outlined in the community engagement envisioning subcommittee report. Our work does not end here. This is only the beginning. Our conversations now need to shift from the subject of the walk and talk program to better understanding the challenges residents are experiencing, the opportunities already present, and the stakeholders that need to be centered in the conversation in order to envision new solutions and systems together. And third, we recommend that the walk and talk program either be disbanded and replaced with a new system now, or slowly phased out as other services and supports are developed alongside the walk and talk program. Using the community input gathered in the conversations previously described, we develop a new way forward to improve our system of public safety for all residents. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bonnie. And, you know, really thanks to your subcommittee for the tremendous work and efforts in seeking to understand and engage a population that deserves much more of our community wide focus. Um, yeah, next up uh, is task force member Almas Dosa for the vulnerable people and people in crisis subcommittee. Almas, take it away. Thank you, Raul. So for our subcommittee, uh, the members for Ann Beaver, Alexander Weinstein and myself, Almas Dosa, we are residents of Brookline uh, with interests and professional experience working with and supporting vulnerable people. And our backgrounds include clinical mental health care, working with differently abled people, teaching, research, and the law. So a bit about the background, uh, our mission was to focus on services and supports that are currently available to vulnerable people in Brookline, people who might be unhoused, have mental health, or substance abuse use issues. We wanted to determine if there were unmet needs for this population. We wanted to also determine if the current services and programs were effectively supporting the needs of the community. And then we wanted to recommend changes in the current model so that we could reduce barriers and more equitably meet their needs. Our process really resulted in the creation of our recommendations, which you will see in a minute. We reviewed national and international articles that focused on programs, including non-police crisis service programs. We did a number of interviews, including uh, Brookline Police Department, the uh, crisis intervention team staff, as well as the social worker there, to learn about the CIT program training, what the gaps were, if there were any. We also interviewed people, the senior staff from the Brookline Center for Community Mental Health, Again, to learn about their programs, what they offer, what the gaps in services were, as well as recommendations that they were making. One of our subcommittee members also interviewed Mental Health First, which is um, an alternative to police crisis intervention, which is based in Sacramento, California. And finally, we interviewed the director of consulting for the CAHOOTS program in Eugene, Oregon. This model was developed in 1989 and it uses a non-police crisis support team as first responders for people in crisis, including unhoused people and people with mental health and substance use issues. The interview with CAHOOTS focused on how the CAHOOTS model works, what are the strengths and the challenges of the model, what the operational costs were and potential cost benefits, and possible, uh, possible implementation in Brookline. In addition to this, we also reviewed the data from the, the task force department and analysis subcommittee survey that you just heard about, which was done um, for 25,000 Brookline residents. And finally, we had many uh, members of the public attend our subcommittee meeting where they asked us questions, they gave us feedback that we followed up on. And we also did a public hearing with about 26 members of the public 
that was held on February 4th, earlier this month. So what were the key findings? We really found a, a, a clear need for uh, pre-crisis and follow-up services. There were gaps that, that we noticed from our interviews uh, that we, when we talked to different people. Uh, the development of such services we also felt should include voices of those who are most directly impacted by the current lack of such services. Again, according to the survey that you heard about, we found that there was uh, overwhelmingly support for non-police non services for uh, people in mental health, substance use, and homelessness as well. And we also found when we looked at the peer-reviewed research articles that the CIT program, the uh, crisis intervention team program is not evidence-based regarding changes in police office behavior in the field. So our recommendations, we had four. The first one was consulting with cahoots. Um, as I mentioned before, this program has teams experience in resolving crisis situations. The teams uh, call for police less than 1% of the time, and it saves money by diverting, diverting people from the uh, emergency medical system, the hospital system, as well as the criminal legal system. Second rec recommendation was to implement additional pre-crisis and follow-up services. So this lack was really evident again in our research findings and our interviews, and we need to increase community-based services and supports in Brookline. Such services, I'll just mention a few, uh, could include peer support specialists, case managers, mobile treatment teams, housing specialists, community drop-in centers, and vocational support services. Third recommendation is we really would like to publicize and inform the public about social services in Brookline. Something like an easy to find web page on the town website and doing community presentations on new and existing services. And our final recommendation is to form a social, social services department in Brookline that would implement recommendations one through three. The lack of such an agency in Brookline is, is a gaping hole. And this agency would coordinate existing services, partner with agencies to enable better communication and coordination across different organizations. And as I said before, would impl implement the first three recommendations. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Amas. And, and thanks to your subcommittee for this really forward thinking work here. Uh, and that's what we're recommending. Um, Brookline move forward. Uh, as you've seen tonight, our task force, which conducted a robust community wide study, met with countless experts and residents over more than six months, has held now six public hearings. This is our seventh. Um, this task force of Brookline residents, after a deep and thoughtful examination of the current state of affairs, is proposing a new way forward. Uh, we propose that the social service uh, needs of Brookline residents in our schools and public housing and elsewhere should not be addressed by the police, but rather coordinated through a new social service agency. Um, the focus of this agency will be to address both the symptoms as well as the root causes of inequities. And the name Brookline Forward is a placeholder. Um, so you see here, Brookline Forward will provide residents, um, if you can go back one, sorry about that. Um, Brookline Forward will provide residents with the services and supports they need to thrive. A new innovative department of the town of Brookline, Brookline Forward will partner with the Brookline Housing Authority, the public schools of Brookline, the Brookline Senior Center and local service, social service agencies to deliver timely critical services while conducting research, analyzing data and implementing programs designed to counteract economic, health, and other inequities deeply rooted in racism, sexism, ageism, and other forms of oppression. Uh, this agency will restructure and expand social services by bringing together existing offices under one umbrella, including the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, Community Relations, the Council on Aging, and the Office of Veteran Services, while also establishing a new office addressing the needs of youth and families um, that's been well discussed tonight, as well as immigrant and refugee services and economic equity. Uh, this new agency will also provide staff support for the Domestic Violence Roundtable, uh, the Commission for Women, the Brookline Commission on Disability, and a new Council on LGBTQIA plus inclusion. Uh, Brookline Full Forward will also partner with other town departments as necessary to meet community needs. That includes working with Health and Human Services to develop a mental health incident response team, with the building and fire departments to ensure residents are living in safe housing, 
And yes, with the police department on diversion efforts for youth. This agency will be funded by municipal dollars, including funds shifted from the police department, as well as local, state, and federal grants. In addition to existing personnel, new staff at inception may include one administrator and three professional staff members, as well as a new commissioner to lead the department. So this is it, folks, uh, and none of this is pie in the sky. This is all possible if we want it and if the select board town meeting and other bodies exercise the leadership necessary to get it done. Uh, it does mean reducing the scope of our police force, which as you saw clearly in our survey is overwhelmingly supported by residents across all backgrounds. It means shifting some funds away from police and instead of spending those funds to address the symptoms of inequities, it means confronting inequities by investing those funds in the long-term well-being of our residents. As I wrap up, I just wanna take a moment to thank the many activists and allies that created the space for our task force to do its work and to all those who shared their times and insights during this process, including many members of the police department. I also wanna express my tremendous gratitude for the volunteer members of the task force who gave their expertise, their emotional energy and countless hours of their time to this effort. Uh, as I've said before, we are Brookline. Parents, grandparents, educators, students, lawyers, professors, and people who also want to live in a safe community without sacrificing the dignity and safety of our neighbors. We think there's a better way forward. We hope you agree. So let's get to your feedback and see what you think. And uh, Devin, um, I will let you uh, take it from here. Great, so I want to welcome folks uh, to use the hand raise feature or Q&A if they would like to make a comment to get in the queue. As was mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, uh, there will be three minutes per person and you will get a uh, notification of that. So the first person we have signed up for public comment is Jeffrey Benson. Jeffrey, you have been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and share your video if you're comfortable and your three minutes will begin. Hey, thanks up first. Wow, thanks for everyone for all that hard work you did. <clears throat> Excuse me. I wanna start off that um, my dad was a cop. And for those of you who've never had a officer in your family, you have no idea what it's like to be an officer, to uh, go into multiple situations and unfortunately, communities and a country that's armed because of our lack of good gun control and how anxious it is to do that job. And for I want to say for most of the white people who are listening in, we have no idea what it's like to walk in the shoes of people of color in this country who have faced multiple, multiple generations of being neglected, abused, overlooked and treated poorly by police. And <clears throat> I think that's where we have to listen to the voices of people of color. And I wanna say it's just the way it is. It's where we are in 2021. It's not saying that any cops in Brookline are bad or good or better or worse. It's just the fact that after all of these generations, there's a barrier to getting social services. If you're a person of color, if those social services go through the funnel of police. And I think about the work we did in schools to make full access to schools. So when there were staircases, we got ramps in. When there were doors that kids couldn't open, we changed how the doors were. We got rid of certain barriers of doorways in the halls and desks and classes because our goal was that everyone would have complete access to the services of schools. And I wanna use that metaphor. And we don't say to the kids who let's say in a wheelchair, tough it out, crawl up the steps, get tougher, face your fears, so you'll be okay. We say, no, we, we get rid of barriers. Right now, unfortunately, the amount of social services that go to people of color through the police is a barrier. It's a barrier to access to services. And we just have to look at that and say, how do we do that better? And I was thinking from the conversation about the, um, the school officers, I was listening in on that committee's excellent work. And one of the things they talked about was how the officers in the school, um, I think I'm right and I can be corrected, we're no longer wearing uniforms because of that created dissonance and kids being a little anxious about them. And I don't think they were carrying their weapons into schools and they weren't intervening in school discipline. And everyone's saying that's the model. And I'm thinking, well, that's the model for the town. 
the people who need to come in to do services for people are one, people who are not in police uniforms, who are not carrying firearms, and do not have a history of being difficult for the people who need the services. So I support fully the work of the committee in looking at how we distribute social services away from the police, because I want to come back to at the beginning, to support police, to give them manageable jobs for which they are well trained and not asking them to do the work that other people can do better and help them do their work as well. So thank you very much for your work. At this time, there are 58 attendees and we would like to encourage folks to use the hand raise or Q&A feature if they'd like to make a public comment. The next person signed up for public comment is Arthur Conquest. Arthur, you have been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and share your video if you're comfortable and your three minutes will begin. Okay. Good evening, Arthur Conquest here. Uh, one thing that I didn't uh, see in the recommendations that the various uh, subcommittees uh, made was to increase the number of Black, Latino, and Asian police officers <clears throat> within the police department. Um, I, uh, I'm not sure what the actual statistics are, um, but I think that it would go a long way in terms of uh, having more members from those three groups uh, that I that I mentioned, uh, and also in terms of the power structure within the police department, and I know that there are civil service rules uh, that are re required, but I also know uh, members of the police force who went to school with my children who are you know not einsteins and they have uh elevated to uh administrative or management positions within the, the police department so i think that's something that you should include in, in your report thank you At this time, we do have a question in the Q&A from a, a attendee and resident who asks if the report covers a response of the police department to crime in Brookline Housing Authority. Um, this recommends that they shouldn't provide social services, but asks if they are providing crime oriented services there um, and perhaps uh, the subcommittee can reference that in their report. Um, I can respond really briefly. Um, the police do uh, also respond to crime. Um, we've been told that the uh, walk and talk officers are removed from um, 911 response and um, assigned very directly to the VHA housing. Um, but they do um, respond to crime there, as well as uh, providing what we described in our report. The next person signed up for public comment is Danelle O'Neill. Danelle, you've been promoted and your three minutes will begin when you're ready. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, Donald O'Neill, town meeting member from Precinct 4. Uh, lifelong resident, Brookline um, Mass. First generation, and I have uh, two second generation young kings coming up um, in this town. So I, I, first of all, I want to say thank you. Thank you all for all the hard work you, you've been doing. I've been able to... Um, keep up with your meetings and and you know I, I, I look forward to the to that eight o'clock meeting and wake up with the coffee and 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 listen to you guys um, hash it out about the important matters of 
of policing in, in, in this town, how we can change and, and do better. Um, I wanted to kind of piggyback on what, what Arthur said, Arthur Conquest said, on the promotion, you know, this could be a personal issue, but but just the way things, officers are promoted within the police station and who does the actual promoting. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if there was a study on how many um, African-American or people of, uh, uh, people of color officers have been promoted recently. Um, you know, and, you know, and, and, the, and the people who actually do the promoting, um, I, I honestly feel that, you know, they haven't been doing a, a, a good job and it hasn't been equitable. Um, so that, that, that's one thing. And I think this might fall under the accountability part of your recommendations with the with the police and um this brookline forward i, I it, it the whole idea of it is 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 is, is, is wonderful and and I, I pray i pray to god that this town would would really pay attention to the to the hard work this this group has done and all the data that 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 you guys have gathered, um, it's 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 been amazing, and all the uncovering and how we can do better, um, it, it it's been amazing, and I, I really appreciate um, you all for for all the hard work. I I, I can't say it enough, um, um, and, and especially you, Devin, for, for being there and 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 and, and helping everyone um, make sure the meetings are out there and we and, and people. People in the public have access to the meetings, and um, it, it, it's just been a wonderful experience. And I, I and I and I hope we can keep this moving forward. Um, that's all I want to say right now. But I, I really feel like the accountability part um, of the police unit is big, and we we really need to uh, focus on that in order to create a better, transparent police department. The police department within itself has to want to do it, um, and it, and it's good to see some some police officers willing to uh, speak up and and, um, and 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 try to do the right thing. Um, so so more accountability for the police. I, I think we need to focus on, and I really appreciate all the hard work. Um, and and I I didn't see about the details. So police detail work um, and. You know, I know in the past that was a problem. I don't know. Back in 2012, it was a, it was an issue, and I was wondering if you guys did any research on have you did any studies on you know police detail work and you know the uh, the abuse with that. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, Devin, I just I just want to just mention a couple of things. Um, so folks, um, you know, make sure folks get a response to, to questions they're asking. I, I think um, you know it's important to understand we have um, we have two bodies operating uh, simultaneously. One is the um, Select Board's Committee on Police Reforms, and the other one is this one, um, Select Board's Task Force to Reimagine Policing in Brookline. I mentioned that the sort of the top the charge and really about sort of exploring alternative models to public safety. Um, there are, and we have discussed, uh, any number of improvements that members of the task force would like to see um, within the police department. Um, we tried to focus our time and energies on the reimagining piece, though, um, rather than focusing on those reforms, because we do have a committee that's been constituted to focus on those areas. I can tell you as a select board member, I certainly have thoughts about all of the questions that you brought up, whether it was um, Arthur bringing up the, um, the hiring of, of officers of color or what Donnell brought up around accountability, um, transparency, um, police details, and any number of those things. So, so I think we'll be having conversations as, um, you know, I know the select board, uh, the, the committee is taking on uh, committee on reforms is taking on some of those challenges, um, but there, there's a lot more work that needs to be done here, um, including by the select board uh, to address some of these issues. So, um, but we'll have a conversation when we meet on Friday uh, to, to 
to review the feedback from this session and see whether or not we think we should be addressing more of these things. It's 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 throughout throughout our six months, uh, we've had a lot of conversations where we're figuring out is that is that them or is that us? Um, and I know that that's that's come up a few times in, in both directions. So um, this is really helpful to get this feedback to to hear that you'd like to um, see um, see us and I imagine other bodies reflect more on these issues. So thank you. The next person signed up for public comment is uh, Natalie Linos. You've been promoted and your time will begin when you're ready. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to step in to say a huge thank you to all the volunteers uh, who have been doing this work. This is truly impressive as someone who, um, you know, I, I live in, uh, in Precinct 6, but I'm a social epidemiologist. I deal with data all the time and seeing such a heavy data-driven, evidence-driven uh, work being conducted, it's, it's truly, truly notable. And, and I love that you looked at good examples in other um, towns and other parts of the country, and this is really helpful. Um, so first of all, to say thank you. Second, to say that I fully support this vision of a Brookline Forward. And it is, you know, it's going to be couched as, um, you know, you're defunding or taking resources away from the police, but we're in the midst of a pandemic when the social kind of mental health crisis that we're experiencing, we're, it, we're gonna feel it for a long time. And this is a gap that you have identified. You have identified a gap in sort of how we respond to social isolation, to crisis, and the police is simply not equipped to deal with that. So um, I think this is the moment to be pushing for a vision for a Brookline that really meets the needs of children, of elderly, of families, of people in, in, in crisis. Many of us are feeling um, extra stress because of the conditions of the pandemic, you know, domestic violence, child related violence is up on the rise and, and really the police is not able to handle that. So I applaud you for putting this forward as a proposal. I think it's not only necessary always, but within this context of a post COVID, you know, the next few years, which lie ahead, I think it's really appropriate. So thank you for that proposal. Um, let us know how we can support that to, to become a reality. Uh, I also want to support the vision of civilian oversight um, and also want to echo, I think it was Bonnie who said that, you know, and, and several of you echoed this, that it's difficult to have conversations about individuals when we're talking about systems and that's gonna be difficult, but it's necessary. And, and this is systemic change that we need, systemic change. And it's not about um, the people who work in the police, but, the conditions, I, I do wanna bring that up. People often turn to the police because it's a good job, right? You have a good career trajectory, you have, um, you know, there, there are good conditions. So I wanna urge you that when you envision Brookline Forward, you ensure that people are paid at similar salaries, that, that it is, you know, they have the right status so that you can get good people in those good jobs, that they have good pension plans, you know, so that people aren't losing out because they come to work in this different department and not the police department. So think about those conditions too. So thank you again for all your work. And it's been a real um, pleasure to, to read uh, some of your reports or, or skim them because I'm a parent, but I will read them in detail after today. Thank you so much. The next person signed up for public comment is Naomi Schweitzer. You've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and share your video and your time will begin when you're ready. Hi everyone, Naomi Schweitzer, uh, town meeting member, Precinct 10. Um, just echoing uh, the former speaker, thank you so much for all of the work and effort um, you have put in over many, many months uh, to formulate uh, your recommendations. Um, and just as a top line, uh, wanna support the Brookline Forward vision. Um, I love how you've pulled everything together um, into that forward thinking vision. And I know there's more work to be done um, and uh, figuring out the specifics of it. And I think we should do it. I think the town, as Raul said, um, these are all doable items. We just need to decide that this is the priority for us and to make them happen. A few other um, comments related to the specifics um, in the report and the recommendations. And one is I just want to applaud all the data um, that you gathered both through the surveys and through 
interviewing um, town residents and also interviewing other communities and looking um, at models from other communities of how we might be doing things differently. And one of the things that seems very clear to me from the data is that we do have a problem where the black and brown people in our town do not feel as safe and don't feel like they have the same access uh, to what they need uh, through the police compared to our white residents. And when you have a problem and you wanna to start to fix things, it's important to center the folks who are having an issue and having the problem because they probably have a lot of great insight into what the solutions might be. So as we think about the next phase of this work of Brookline Forward and whatever this looks like in terms of warrant articles and items in the budget, um, that we have a process that makes sure that we are centering black and brown people in that planning process to make the recommendations of what that looks like so that we make sure that we are responsive and we don't make some of the same mistakes as starting programs like the school resource officer and the walk and talk programs, which from all the research you all did, it looks like had very little um, community input and that had a disproportionate and unhappy impact um, on black and brown people. Um, so I hope that we can going forward uh, rectify um, how we do our business um, that's more transparent um, and centered um, on making sure the solutions are responsive uh, to the people most impacted by some of these problems. I also really um, strongly support uh, setting up a civilian oversight board. Um, it is clear from now what feels like decades of headlines of uh, some of the behavior of some of Brookline's police officers and the survey responses that you receive that we have a problem and we need to address that with more transparency. And so I think we should take you up on that recommendation and go forward um, and look at what specifically that would look like for Brookline so that we can start to root out that problem problem um, and make it so that, um, again, um, especially our neighbors and visitors and employees of color um, feel safe and comfortable um, living and working and passing through our town. I want to touch on the walk and talk program briefly. Um, it was really illuminating to read and report the information and the history of this program. And um, I am not a resident of the Brookline Housing Authority, um, but I am just struck by thinking about how I would feel if the police just started to show up and have a program in my neighborhood where they were around all the time. Um, and that just, uh, just, it feels odd to me and it feels strange that there was not input, it doesn't seem from BHA residents when that program was started and that many of the BHA residents are either uncomfortable or extremely reticent to talk about the program. Um, and so again, it feels like we have a problem there. And I agree with the committee that that is a program that should be uh, disbanded or majorly reshaped into something that is actually responsive to what Brookline Housing Authority residents want, including um, maybe the strong likelihood that they don't want it at all. Um, and the place to start is by asking them with what they want and what's gonna make them feel safe and connected to what they need from the police. And then finally, I will end um, by sharing some of what I shared with one of the subcommittees at an earlier public hearing um, is that uh, my professional work is in the realm of creating housing solutions to homelessness. I've worked here in the Boston area and I work nationally with communities to help them address and end homelessness. And I also um, on a personal level, um, have uh, multiple family members with major mental health issues and substance use uh, challenges. And uh, the solution to mental health, substance use, and a lack of housing is not policing. It is housing, um, affordable housing, and appropriate access to trauma-informed services 
um, that is readily available um, when you need it. And introducing police into those functions is unfair to the police. It's putting them in a role that they are not equipped um, or trained to deal with. And it is scary and anxiety producing for the people dealing with those situations to put someone with a gun and the ability to arrest them in those situations and often can escalate um, a situation that could be de-escalated with the right um, response and people properly trained to deal with it. So I am so glad that this committee reached out to CAHOOTS and strongly support further consulting with them and the formation of a social services department uh, within the town that um, can really do what you've been talking about throughout and thread threaded throughout the report, which is that we need to tackle these inequities and not treat the symptoms. And we can't expect the police to be in the role of treating the symptoms when that is, uh, they're not trained for it and they don't have the solutions. They have their law enforcement role of arrest and if need to force, and those are the wrong solutions for those problems. We can do so much better. You have laid out so many great solutions and possibilities, and I look forward to what's next and I am available to help um, as you move forward with it. So thank you. The next comment I'd like to make the task force aware of is in the Q&A. Uh, this patient attendee has children around or would prefer not to go on video or audio, uh, but would like to make a comment and ask a question. First, they are thanking all of the members of the task force for the hard work they have put into the report and for these recommendations. The creation of a social services agency would build a healthy and resilient community right here in Brookline. So many of these services are fundamental human rights. How do you think this agency would work collaborate with other nonprofit groups in town to support community members? Additionally, there are a lot of uh, comments in the Q&A that indicate support for this work and uh, are asking for uh, ways that the community members can support you um, in the uh, continuation of this process. And perhaps that's something that can be addressed at the conclusion of the hearing. Next person signed up for public comment is Deborah Brown. Deborah, you've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and share your video if you're comfortable and your time will begin. Hi, my name is uh, Deborah Brown. I'm a town meeting member for Place One. And uh, I, I also want to thank you all for just the outstanding I actually want to, to direct these comments to uh, people that may be opposed to, you know, the whole reimagining process. And, and I, want, I want to do it by analogy. Many years ago, I had a job and my job was, you know, to work on a, 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 a childhood lead poisoning program. And everybody told me the best way to correct the problem was, was with, you know, compliance. Just continue to talk to people. And anybody that knows me, you know, I can be a bit of a curmudgeon lawyer. And so I said, but it, it, is what we're doing really working? And the answer was, it's working as well as we can expect it. These are the only tools we have in our toolbox. And so what I did is I said, okay, let, let's try something different. So I set up a different kind of program. I got a handful of people together and we did it. And what we found was that the status quo approach, it was okay. But that in one year we had corrected somewhere in the neighborhood, I think it was over 5,000 potentially lead poisoned children because we just said, well, you know what? We're gonna throw this old model out and we're gonna try something different. And people were upset. They were like, you, you know, you juice in the books. It can't be that. It can't, you can't, you can't get this kind of result by doing something different. 
This is the tried and true. We must stick with it. And, and those numbers were good. And so the people that are uneasy about this, I, I would encourage you to just close your eyes, take a deep breath, and, and allow your imagination to envision a, a path and a process that may likely get far better results than what we've been doing that seems to get the same response. So again, I wanna thank everybody for all of your hard work. Uh, I, I, I do think the, the, the emphasis on enforcement and punishment is, is, is a heck of a way, is, is the right way to go. It just hasn't worked. And you know, we, we've had what in this country as an African-American over 400 years of trying this, you know, we're, we're, as 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 an African American woman, I I can easily say we're long overdue for something different. So thank you all. Um, Devin, if I can just take a minute and respond to the question that was in the chat, I think I think it's an important one. Uh, and again, essentially, um, you know, how do you think this agency would work slash collaborate with other nonprofit groups in town to support community members? Um, I think the, it, this is absolutely critical, is that um, the gap that's been identified here is, is the town's deep involvement in this work. We have amazing organizations like the Brookline Teen Center that was mentioned earlier, Steps to Success, um, the Brookline Community Foundation, um, the, the Food Pantry and others that are frankly, um, in many ways, though they're doing amazing work, still struggling still struggling to get the resources they need to meet the need that's here in the community. And one of the things that, that this department would be able to do is to help coordinate resources, to be ears on the ground, to know exactly what those needs are, and to figure out how we as a community um, through, um, through the public side and the private side can rally together to meet those needs. Um, there is no reason at all why a community with the abundance that Brookline has um, cannot support the needs of, of our community in public and subsidized housing, um, Im our immigrant community and other low income residents. There's no reason why we can't do that. What's missing here seems to be this ability for us to coordinate efforts. Um, and this is one of the ways that we can help do that. Uh, in addition to something the select board actually just passed, which was this new um, town Brookline Housing Authority working group um, that we're gonna be starting up and, 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 and I'm gonna be involved in pulling together as a co-chair um, in the coming days. So, um, you know, this is, um, this is in alignment with that vision, that vision of greater coordination, um, more ears on the ground, more community feedback. There was a phenomenal um, community engagement plan, um, a Warren article that was passed, and then the Commission for Diversity, Inclusion, Community Relations, along with the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, Community Relations, uh, actually worked on this community engagement plan, which is now part of the way that Brookline does business. Uh, and so all of this is, is, is well in alignment with with everything else, um, with the direction that's really been set already uh, in many ways um, uh, by others. So anyway, just wanted to offer that. At this time, there are 49 attendees and we are encouraging folks to use the hand raise or Q&A feature if you'd like to make a public comment during this hearing. If you are unable to make a comment or you're watching this after the fact, uh, via the Brookline Interactive Group, our very generous partner. Please email your comments uh, regarding the draft report or work of the task force to dfields at brooklinema.gov.
at this time we do have 46, 45 attendees and we are encouraging folks to use the Q&A or hand raise feature if you would like to make a comment. Arthur Conquest has been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and your time will begin. Quickly, I'm sorry. I apologize for coming back on again. I just want to thank um, each and every one of you. Um, I didn't say that the first time and I put it in the chat, but I, I want to thank you for um, your time and your hard work. Um, I know that, you know, whether it's early in the morning or late at night, um, every one of you have put, you know, a tremendous amount of work in making this possible. And I'm, I know that it's going to make this community a better place um, for all of us uh, to, to live. And it's because of the sacrifices that you've made. I'm dead serious too, okay, that um, that's going to happen. So I thank you very much. I didn't say it the first time. Excuse my manners, I didn't mean to be rude, um, but uh, thank you, okay? The next person signed up for public comment is Ryan Black. Ryan, when you're ready, your time will begin. Hi everyone, uh, Ryan Black, he, him, his, uh, president of Precinct 6. I also firstly wanna thank everyone on the task force for your work and research and all the brain power and effort that went into these recommendations and uh, for your dedication as well, I, I'm thinking, uh, Forgive me if I'm forgetting any nouns. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's it's a relief to see reflected in your recommendations an understanding of the need to address the the root causes of various economic and social issues. It's, it's issues which, you, as you all know, are the causes of despair and criminality and which often lead to kind of like people getting funneled into the criminal justice system. And I'm, I'm glad Select Board Member Fernandez brought up how fortunate Brookline is to have the resources it does. And, and so with, with that in mind, and also kind of the holistic approach to economic and social issues you all are taking, I, I just want to put it out there for when we get to a point where we're implementing, like, for example, Brookline Forward, you know, a social services department. And I, I think it's important that we, we it's, you know, of course, we're, it's going to be a Brookline town agency, you know, its primary focus will be Brookline, but I think we also have to look at the wider region as well, because you know, I think sadly, oftentimes we'll, we tend to think of ourselves as an island here in Brookline, but we're not. Like we're you know surrounded three sides by Boston, you know, within like driving distance, like several other municipalities, and these issues that we're all talking about, they're they're not unique to Brookline, and it's like we're one part of a larger system. So I just uh, implore you all to take a, a very holistic approach and think about things like how our place in the wider system. And lastly, and this is kind of a hard transition to a different point, but yeah, I'm so glad you all recognize the importance of kind of fostering community engagement. And I hope kind of like every avenue arm of town government thinks about how just generally, like if you look at our town government, like no offense to the people involved in it, I love many of you, but uh, like it's, it's generally people of a certain income status who can afford to participate in town government who have the ability to essentially, you know, log on to these Zoom meetings, can you maybe hire a babysitter to watch the kids like during normal times when they go to town hall. And I think uh, we have to have that understanding of kind of economic inequality when it comes to how we go about uh, fostering community engagement. So yeah, just want to put those thoughts out there. Thank you again for your work. At this time, I want to bring task force members attention to uh, comments in the Q&A, just continuing to support the thoroughness and thoughtfulness of the task force 
meetings, the subcommittee meetings, all of these presentations, uh, the vision that has taken place in this reimagining work, uh, and the excitement surrounding Brookline Forward. At this time, there are 41 attendees, and we are encouraging folks to use the hand raise feature or Q&A to indicate that you would like to make a comment in this public hearing. This could also be an opportunity for task force members to uh, talk a little bit about how community members can support this uh, vision and proposal moving forward. Sure, and I'll, I will um, talk for a moment, but the, the minute we see a, a hand go up or anyone indicate that they'd like to share something, um, I'll break and, and, and we'll take that comment. Um, you know, just so folks know what the next steps are here, uh, this coming Friday, our task force will meet as we have every Friday morning at 8 a.m., as, as uh, Donnell O'Neill mentioned earlier. Uh, so you're welcome to join us. Um, the information is on the, um, the Brookline calendar. Uh, and you can find it there, uh, the Zoom info there. So we'll meet this Friday to sort of talk about, um, you know, what we heard tonight. Uh, and so you'll, you'll see us do that. Uh, then we've got a week um, to, to sort of uh, spiff up uh, and put together the final version of the, of the task force report, which one week from this Friday, so 26, we'll actually meet and then, and then finally adopt the final version of our task force report. We will send that uh, immediately to the select board so that they have an opportunity um, to read it uh, over the weekend. Uh, and I hope they read uh, every word on every page uh, before uh, having a presentation delivered to the select board on Tuesday, March 2nd. Um, that night, we'll also have a presentation from the select board's committee on police reform. So. It's a great night to tune in and, and see all the work that's been done from the task force as well as the committee. Um, that is not, however, a night where I, th I believe um, public comment is being taken. We're going to have the presentation delivered to the select board. And then two weeks later on March 16th, that is when there's going to be a public hearing. So we've got two weeks and people can email us and share their thoughts with us, you know, um, you know reach out with questions, whatever it is. But then on the 16th, um, you know, uh, particularly for those uh, those of you who were here tonight, we'd love to see you again on the 16th uh, of March to, to come and, and share some of the thoughts you shared tonight and maybe some others that you have in your mind that, that you didn't share uh, for whatever reason. Um, so that'll be the public hearing on the 16th. And then we're expected to have a vote um, as soon as two weeks after that public hearing, Tuesday, March 30th. Uh, and so those are those those are those key dates for us. March second, presentation to the select board. March sixteenth, the public hearing. Please show up, come, share your thoughts and views. And then March thirtieth, we expect some vote um, to take place on um, on our work. Uh, if any of that changes, we'll do our best to notify uh, you know as many people as possible about um, about any changing dates there. Um, so I think I hope that's helpful um, for people to understand what the next steps are. Uh, and you know, frankly. As I mentioned toward the end of the presentation, um, the one thing that is going to get this done is, um, you know, I think we've evidenced in our work a great deal of support from the community for um, for our recommendations. Our recommendations actually come from uh, the, the, you know, the, the the community feedback that we've received through all these different methods that have been covered tonight, um, and through the feedback from our public hearings. This is again our seventh public hearing now, uh, and. Um, but we're going to need you to show up again. We're going to need you to show up, particularly on Tuesday, March 16th. Um, if this is something that you support, this is a direction you want us to go down, um, the select board's going to need to hear it then. We do have about 20 minutes left in this public hearing. At this time, there are 40 attendees and we are encouraging folks to use the hand raise or Q&A feature to indicate they'd like to make a public comment. If you're unable or uncomfortable making a public comment now, we do encourage written comments, which can be sent to dfields at brooklinema.gov. I would like to make task force members aware of a comment in the Q&A, which is 
thanking task force members for the thoughtful and healing work. Uh, it's clear that a need has been identified in Brookline around creating social services, prevention, and integrated effort to change racism and inequities that do exist in Brookline. Uh, there's full support uh, for the task force and their research uh, looking uh, forward in this reimagining vision. I do want to make task force members aware of a comment in the Q&A. Uh, there is support of the recommendations. It also occurs to this attendee that the proposals could face less resistance downstream if more information could be provided about the details of funding Brookline Forward. Uh, does the task force have a sense of how much is needed from the police, how much might come from existing departments, how much would be new, etc.? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I want to respond to that one, actually. I think that's a great question. Um, we are actually in the process of costing this out. And when I say we, um, our town administrator, Mel Kleckner, actually has taken on that task. We were hoping to have some of that information for tonight. But as, um, as, as regular select board viewers uh, may know, we were just presented with the FY22 budget this past Tuesday and uh, Mel Kleckner, Melissa Goff and uh, you know, um, oh my God, everyone basically in, in, the, in the select board's office, um, Justin, De Devin, everybody was working on that budget. So what I have been told is that we will have those numbers um, by the time our March 2nd presentation comes around. Um, I, I think it's absolutely important that, um, that as we consider this, we know what the impacts are, even, even as, you know, uh, the, you know, we think there's ample evidence to show that this is something that we need to do and that there's some urgency around it. Um, I also know as a select board member um, that, our, uh, that there are budget realities as well. And so we need to, if this money is going to be uh, moved to this department, it's gotta come from somewhere. We also have to more specifically identify where it comes from. That part I don't think is the work of the task force though. That, that really is the work of, of the town administrator and the select board in, in figuring out um, and shifting funds, let's say from police. And by the way, um, with the involvement of the chief of police as well too, um, in figuring out exactly where, um, where we can best shift funds from one place to the other. So um, that's something where um, I've certainly got some thoughts about it, but I wanna make sure that we consult with, um, with our budget managers um, and, and ultimately with the full select board um, before jumping to conclusions about where funds should get shifted from. With that said, I do think that in the next couple of weeks, um, we will have for, for the public um, a general ballpark estimate. Um, and this is not just out of nowhere, but from people who know uh, our, our HR director, um, Ann Braga, who's also um, been, um, uh, who's also one of the staff members, again, who's been with us week after week, um, you know, I do believe is going to be involved in that part of the process too, in figuring out the staffing costs of something like this too. So we'll have that for you soon enough. At this time, there are 39 attendees and we want to encourage people uh, in the next we have a new public comment request. The next person signed up for public comment is Carla Banka. Carla, you've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and share your video if you're comfortable and your time will begin. I don't know how I just got promoted. All I did was log on. Ooh, I saw your hand raised. Sorry about that. Okay. Good to see you, Carla. <laughs> well, I was on. No. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, 
I'm going to uh, bring task force members attention to the Q&A and uh, share that an attendee has uh, offered up that they appreciate the committee's approach to going small and having conversation with folks that are reticent. Uh, Brookline needs to be creative and responsive in engagement efforts. Danelle, you've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and your time will begin when you're ready. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so once again, I just wanna say thank you one more time. And I was, I was um, the funding question came up about how, how, how to get this uh, Brookline Forward funded. And I was curious on have, have, um, has the task force reached out to anyone from the AC on on their thoughts on this? Um, I see that smile. <laughs> the reason why I asked, but I'm just I'm just curious because I think this would help m move the process if if you do talk to someone or a few people actually from from the AC on um, just to gain some support from there. All right, that's all I have to say. Uh, and thank you again, um, all of you, for all your hard work. Uh, Donnell, thanks for that. Actually, um, the the chair of the advisory committee, Mike Sandman, is a is a member of the of the task force, and I mean a resident member of the task force. Uh, and Mike, if there's anything you'd like to share at this point, uh, floor is yours. Um, well, certainly, uh, it's something that's uh, very very close to my heart and very much in my mind. Is you know, where's what's the cost and where are the funds going to go from? Come from? I I think it's important to recognize that the sort of scale that we're talking about. Um, is not going to be overwhelming. Um, it, uh, finding money at this particular moment in town is very difficult, but um, looking down the road to a more normal year, um, it's a, a very different situation, uh, I would hope. Uh, so I, uh, I don't think that money is going to be as much of a barrier as um, the need to think through very carefully uh, what we're going to do and the will to actually make changes. Thanks, Mike. At this time, we have about 10 minutes remaining in the scheduled public hearing. There are currently 35 attendees and we would like to encourage folks to use this remaining time uh, who have not shared with us before or, uh, or maybe just joining the conversation now. Uh, if you'd like to make a comment to the task force or uh, give thoughts on their preliminary uh, report, to use the hand raise feature or Q&A to make a comment, question, or suggestion. This is it, folks. Anything on your, uh, on your head or in your heart that you'd like to share now, we would love to hear it, so uh, feel free. The next person signed up for public comment is Andrew Leung. You've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and share your video if you're comfortable and your time will begin. My time has started now. So, Raul, you, you'd be sorry for that comment, okay? No problem. <laughs> um, just having a quick look and listening to you folks earlier, I think overall, one of the main things I wanna stress is about getting some sense of transparency, especially with respect to what 
kind of interaction that folks in Brookline have with um, the police, especially as an Asian American, I'm very much taken aback. I'm pissed off right now, looking at that kind of disparity in, in the tickets just for two years in the data that we do have. So, you know, going backwards, going forwards, right? Do we, is there in fact a particular problem of disproportionality um, that, that we see, you know, Asian Americans drivers being ticketed more often than anybody else, okay? Does that mean I have to pay more as an Asian American for driving around Brookline? You know, whereas other people, this is disproportionality, this is discrimination. And, and so, you know, this is just one particular area. So if we actually have transparency of data, of, of everything else relating to how the police interact with its citizenry, um, I, I think you know, that level of transparency will, will really engage us much, much more as a community. Thank you. And thank you all for the work. So thanks for that, Andrew. And, and, I, and I do um, encourage folks to um, to look at the data that's in the report um, that, that Andrew's pointing out there. Um, there's some really stark discrepancies. And um, I know Chichi mentioned this during her portion of the presentation, but the um, to put a sort of uh, finer point on it, um, you know, we, we really went deep to try to understand um, whether or not people were disproportionately stopped um, based on, on their race. Um, we believe that they are in Brookline based on um, all of our work and including the work of the Transportation Administrator, Todd Corain, who presented some really um, important uh, data around traffic patterns through Brookline. It's also important to understand that 84% of the people stopped in Brookline are not Brookline residents. Um, and so the, the, the vast majority of people stopped in Brookline um, for any number of, of, um, of violations are actually not residents. Uh, but what was absolutely clear were the data um, that showed when people are stopped already for um, for the same infraction, particular speeding, and we had a, I think somewhere in the order of about two thousand stops that we looked at. So this is not you know this person you know was rude or that person. This this is big data we're looking at here. Um, we saw some stark disparities, particularly most evident between white drivers who were significantly more likely to get a, a warning rather than a ticket versus Asian drivers who were significantly more likely to get a ticket instead of a warning for the very same infraction. Uh, and of course, this is despite um, you know, the anti-bias training and other things that, that the department has engaged in um, throughout the years, including more recently. And so, um, so we see this inherent bias and there's been no no other, um, I would say reasonable, but just no other explanation for, for those numbers. Um, and, and, and we're, we're still, um, you know, we can't find one, um, the department can't provide one. Uh, and and to, to Andrew's uh, really important point, uh, one of the things that, that I think we'll keep hammering home in, the, home in these presentations is the need to collect more data and then to use that data, to use it in training, to use it in, in making it public so that, that members of the public can be aware and actually um, ask for change. Uh, that's something that isn't happening at, at the levels we'd like to see. Um, you know, we uncovered that uh, when you look at the field um, interrogations, the so-called FI stops that are captured in the annual report of the police department, um, those are not all the stops that take place. Those are all the stops where something was, was determined to essentially be a good stop. And that there are many stops that, um, that the police simply do not record at all. Uh, now we're not saying that someone who gets stopped and, and they, were, they weren't doing anything in the first place that they should be held and asked for their ID and everything so that we can have an accurate record of who got stopped. Um, but we do think that that stop should be recorded. Um, the same thing with traffic stops. Not all traffic stops actually are recorded in Brooklyn. Uh, and that's another area where we think we have to we have to record everything. Otherwise, it makes it really difficult for the next iteration uh, of a reform committee or a reimagining task force to actually understand the problems that that might be evident in the data if the data were collected. Uh, and so that is, um, you know, of all the things that we've uncovered, 
the lack of MOUs, the lack of agreements um, dating back decades, the lack of, um, of, of, of measurable outcomes, the, the lack of all this, the, the sheer lack of usable data um, that, uh, you know, it, it's almost remarkable that we were able to find biases in the data that was available to us, understanding that not all data is being collected. So that alone, that needs, that needs to change immediately. Um, and there's no reason why we can't make those changes immediately. Um, uh, we just need to start changing our policies there. So um, I appreciate Andrew, um, your heartfelt comments there and, um, and, and that's gonna stick with me for a while. So thank you. We have a few minutes remaining. And at this time there are 32 attendees. There is a question and comment in the Q&A that I'd like to direct task force members to. From what you can tell, how will the jurisdiction of new Brookline Ford affect the day-to-day -day jobs of the remaining police force? Will they be able to shift their focus meaningfully because of Brookline Ford's presence as an alternative? Thank you. Graham, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that, that we see loud and clear in the survey is that, um, is that Brookline residents do support the police addressing criminal activity. Uh, and, and that's, I mean, that's, that's loud and clear. That, that one slide, uh, I think that's gonna be a, a, like a really important slide for people to take a look at. That one slide that showed the data about, do you think police should be the first responders? Do you think social service folks should be the first responders or some mix thereof? And there's some real clear disparities um, that, that Brookline residents are telling us we think police should definitely, you know, be addressing, um, you know, major criminal activity that's happening in Brookline. We just don't think that they should be playing a social service role. What the Brookline Forward uh, proposal contemplates is that um, there are other folks on the front line, not police on the front line, but the police aren't going anywhere necessarily as a department anyway. They are still there the same way the fire department is and the building department is and the health department is to partner with them as needed. Um, but, but, but we do, you know, you see this based on the work of numerous subcommittees. We do think that there are people that are, are, are much more, much better trained and much more appropriate um, to take on that role than, um, than, than armed police personnel. Uh, it, it's, it's just clear as day. And it's, I think it's well supported in the, in the findings from our large survey, as well as our goal small approach. We have 31 attendees and we do uh, ask that folks who are interested in public comment use the hand raise or Q&A feature uh, as we take these final minutes to hear from the public. Uh, you are also more than welcome to submit written comment via email. At this time, I'd like to uh, ask the task force to uh, see a question and comment in the Q&A. What is the difference between the reimagining task force and the reform committee. We, of the reimagined proposals are reforms to policies already in place. So why are there two groups? Yeah, that's a good question, Ade. Um, you know, this is, and frankly, there are two groups right now and um, only because of the fact that there have been two groups uh, that's the reason we've been able to cover so much ground, even though it's taken us just over six months to get to this point. And frankly, there's a lot more work to be done, um, I think, on the reimagining side. Uh, and there's a lot more work to be done on the reform side. Uh, this, this, this approach has enabled us um, to focus on conceptualizing a new way forward that, that isn't bogged down in, in considering uh, things like uh, hiring policies, which are important, um, whether or not we should be in the civil service system, which is an important question that needs to be answered, um, and 
other policies like things related to body cameras, which is an important conversation that we need to have. And the list goes on and on and on, right? Uh, so the, the reform committee has taken on some of those questions, not all yet. And again, it's a lot of work that needs to be done moving forward. Um, this really is just the beginning, I think. Um, but what our ability to focus on reimagining re is done, and as I said this during the presentation, um, reform efforts have failed time and time again to deliver for the folks who Naomi Schweitzer was talking about that need to be centered, right? For communities of color, for low income folks, uh, and for others that are disproportionately impacted by policing. Reform efforts simply have been inadequate and in some cases, very harmful, um, including broken windows policing, um, which was seen as a reform effort, uh, including um, aspects of community policing, which is seen as a reform effort, um, including stop and frisk, including the list goes on and on and on. These are actually all, we think of them today as obviously bad practices, but these were all tied to reform efforts that were sold as, as making communities safer and making them safer for everyone. And what we've seen is the, is the connection between those policies um, and increased mass incarceration, um, the increase in dignities for communities of color, over policing of communities of color, um, and, 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 and very tragically, um, the deaths uh, of, especially of people of color um, by police. Uh, there, is a, there, there will be a police department, I believe, uh, in, in, 20, in 2021 and 2022 and beyond. And because of that, there's an intense need to focus on some of these reform questions. Um, with that said, our charge, uh, and you know, I think the volunteers um, here who've stepped up have done it well, was to conceptualize a different way forward. Uh, and that's not because only the 11 members of the task force that you see here um, thought that was the right thing to do, um, but because a community spoke out and asked for it, in fact, demanded it. Um, a community right here in Brookline, again, not in Louisville, not in Ferguson, not in Minneapolis, but the community in Brookline demanded it for our, our public safety approach here. Uh, and, and a unanimous five person select board in the end uh, approved it uh, to happen. And so, so that's why you see the focus on, uh, on this new approach. Uh, and, and we do think that it is all driven by and rooted in um, the data that we receive from the community. And so um, we'll keep talking about that, but, but yes, all of these other things that folks have brought up are all really important um, aspects that we need to consider uh, and, and implement further reforms within the police department. Um, our charge was just very different than that. All right, at this time, there are 29 attendees and we'd like to make an all call for anyone who'd like to give a uh, public comment through the Q&A or hand raise feature uh, before we close this public hearing. All right, Devin, um, I say we call it. Uh, I will say that um, the in terms of next steps, once again, uh, we, will, we will be uh, sort of live presenting again. Well, you're welcome to join our meeting this Friday, of course. Uh, we'll be presenting again um, our final report to the select board on Tuesday, March 2nd. We'd love to see, I would love to you know, see you there uh, or watch from home, um, but especially on Tuesday, March 16th. That is when we're gonna have the public hearing. We'd love to see you then um, to share your thoughts once again uh, and any new thoughts you may have, that would be terrific. Uh, and then of course, uh, potentially March 30th, as early as March 30th, we might have uh, a vote on the select board. Uh, so the, the, the final thing I'd like to say is um, just thank you. And I cannot thank enough the, um, you know, you all for attending, of course, but I'm thinking about these um, these brilliant, uh, accomplished, um, you know, thoughtful, heartfelt um, volunteers, residents all who have stepped up to do this work uh, under really difficult circumstances, quite frankly. 
uh, and it fills um, it fills my heart um, to see y'all every every week at our meetings and in subcommittee meetings and and doing this work. And you know, I've got um, you know a lot closer to you all. Uh, and some folks who I didn't even know before this process began, uh, I just I, I just cannot thank you enough for all your work. And I also cannot stress enough the tremendous support that we've gotten from the staff members who were were put in this charge and and met the charge. I believe stepped up, um, were available when we needed them to be, were at the meetings regularly. Um, in many cases, were were deeply engaged in the conversations that we were having. Um, and I think it's a fantastic model of, uh, of town support for residents. Um, again, a community gets to decide its approach to public safety uh, and, and not anyone else. And for, for the town to support residents of this community coming together and putting forward these proposals, I, 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 think, I think I wanna applaud them too. Uh, and, and none more than Devin Fields, who has been uh, a tremendous, uh, support for this body. I see the work that Devin does with the reform committee as well. And I see the work that she does every week with the select board too, not to mention uh, all of her other many duties uh, as assigned uh, for the town of Brookline. So I wanna say thank you to Devin. Um, and just a final thanks, look at that, the love. And a final thanks to our friends at Brookline Interactive Group who have been with us every step of the way uh, and who um, quite seamlessly, frankly, uh, after COVID hit, um, helped um, not just you know bodies like ours, but bodies across the town um, transition um, to the virtual format and are carrying us live at Brookline Interactive Group, but also so many other town bodies and are enabling even greater engagement, the kind of community engagement that we've been talking about, either greater, even greater engagement in our in our in our politics. So, um, thank you for that. Um, thanks to everyone. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. And please, if you do have any other comments, email Devin Fields at dfields at brooklinema.gov. We would love to hear from you. All right. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you soon. Have a good night.